Hi guys, Andrew here with headphones.com. Today we're going to talk all about EQ and its limitations. That's right, I'm going to tell you not to do something that I do myself. Such a hypocrite. Okay, maybe more specifically, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't feel confident about using EQ profiles like the ones that I've created or, you know, that you might see in other different places where the goal of those EQ profiles is to match the target or to get the headphones that you're using to sound like the target. Now, for those wondering, I'm also working on a video that takes you through my process for EQing headphones, because of course I EQ my headphones uh, from start to finish, but that's not what this video is going to be about. Instead, I'm using this video to take the opportunity to address one of the more interesting criticisms of my reviews that I've seen recently. As many of you know, this channel is an extension of the Headphones.com community and content platform, and it's not at all influenced by the fact that Headphones.com is also a store where you can buy headphones. And straight up, if that's what this were all about, then I just wouldn't be doing it. But not everybody gets that right away, and that's actually fine. I think in some ways I'd expect that kind of criticism, given that it's not obvious if you're unfamiliar with what we're doing. What was interesting to me was a recent comment that I saw criticizing my reviews, suggesting I was able to recommend high-end headphones for the sake of the store by reviewing it with EQ in mind. The idea was that I could save expensive headphones that were less than ideal for their tuning, so that I could recommend them and wouldn't have to put out a negative review. Now once again, I'd like to think that, you know, the folks who've been with us for a while know that that's not what we're doing on this channel, but I actually thought this was one of the better criticisms on this topic. And so I figured I'd make this video clarifying a number of things, you know, how EQ factors into my evaluations, or, you know, the role that EQ plays in my reviews. And I think maybe some folks also see me as like the EQ guy and think I just EQ everything to the Harman target and then say everything is good with EQ. I actually don't think that's a good thing to do. I don't recommend doing that. But one thing to note before we move ahead with the rest of this video is that what I'm about to say will make way more sense if you've already watched stages eight and nine of the recent video I did on how to read headphone measurements or the different stages of, of reading headphone measurements. That will go a long way to understanding what I'm about to say and the reasons why I think you shouldn't use EQ profiles, or at least you shouldn't feel confident in them. Um, and I'll leave that link in the description for those who haven't seen it yet. So first, let's just cover what this is. What is EQ? Well, in short, EQ, or equalization, is a way to change and ideally improve the tonal balance and frequency response to achieve sound quality that's better than what it might have been before. And my favorite way to do this is using Equalizer APO with the Peace UI, but there are countless other apps and software and devices and things like that that help you do that. For mobile use, I actually really recommend the Qtelix 5K because it's basically like having Equalizer APO in your pocket. You can make all kinds of adjustments with that thing. But essentially, if you want more bass, you can boost the lower frequencies. If you want less, you can reduce them, and so on. Beyond that, it can also be used to fix certain resonances and problem regions for headphones that might otherwise be desirable if they didn't have those issues. And I actually even get this comment a lot in my videos, why not just have a flat frequency response and then EQ it to your heart's content? And you could mean this flat as in target adherence, but also I think some people just mean like raw flat, just so that it, they have an easier time, you know, making the adjustments to their to their preference, um, so that there's a sort of smoothness to the whole thing. And it is not at all that simple. So I'm going to say this now as clearly as possible, so people don't take it the wrong way. In my view, EQ is a crutch. Maybe you want to call this a necessary evil, or the lesser of two evils, or whatever. You get the idea. It is something that you would rather not have to do. Ideally, I'd love to have the perfect headphone where I don't have to do any EQ, and the frequency response perfectly matches what my brain expects to hear with the preference tilt that I like, or at least the preference tilt that I know I like. It's just that this headphone doesn't exist. There are some that are close, and really my favorite headphones are the ones that are close, the ones that I don't feel I really need to dive in and you know bother to change all the fine grain stuff. And I think at most I would use simple filters, like adding a subtle bass boost or something like that, like a simple shelf filter and then leave it at that. That's my ideal situation. And you might be saying, well, why not just have everything be perfect? Well, the reason for that is because for open back headphones, there are actually acoustic limitations to what's possible, especially with certain designs. And this makes it so that achieving exactly what I would want, unlikely without EQ. And I say unlikely because maybe in the future, right? But for example, if I want a distinct sub bass shelf, like or a bass shelf below 150 hertz, in an open back planar magnetic headphone. That is a bit of a tall order because that would require certain front seal design choices or some other kind of trickery that most manufacturers are currently unwilling to do. And that's also why you don't tend to see open back planars with that kind of distinct sub bass shelf. And I will also do another video on that in the future to explain that a little bit further, but I am hopeful that maybe one day this would exist. So I'm just saying for the moment, 
you know, this stuff doesn't exist yet because manufacturers aren't doing this. In any case, the point here is that there is an important difference between any of my evaluations that are EQ required and EQ optional. So in spite of the fact that I would personally EQ just about everything to my taste, there are all kinds of headphones where you don't need to do anything. Like there are all kinds of headphones that likely sound great to most people without any adjustment, or they have some kind of flavor where I would say this is really well suited to a particular recording style or, uh, you know, a given genre or something like that. So, you know, they don't need to be perfect for me, but I could see why someone would like them. Headphones that require EQ to sound good, on the other hand, are absolutely more deserving of scrutiny and criticism, especially if they come with a high price tag. In these situations, it's essentially like me saying there are less expensive headphones out there that have a better tuning, or, you know, this particular tuning sounds wonky, or this should have been tuned better in one area or another. And if you're looking for the no EQ tier of headphones that I recommend without any adjustment, there's a list for that in the description. There, video over, you can go about your day. Okay, but realistically, I'm speaking more to those who are already comfortable doing EQ and use profiles for their headphones. And more importantly, all those people who expect that using an EQ profile to match the Harman target is going to be what sounds best to them. You know, because they think that it's objectively correct. Because it actually might not be, and probably isn't. You might think, if you're going to EQ anyways, can't you just EQ everything to the Harman target and be happy? That actually seems reasonable, and I totally get why people do it. Or maybe another thought process would be, we should only be evaluating THD, you know, harmonic distortion, because we're bound to EQ anyways, and a headphone that can handle it should be more desirable than one that can't. You know, regardless of what its frequency response is, because we can always just, you know, adjust that with EQ anyways. But this is where I have to stress once again that there's more to frequency response than just target adherence. I think oftentimes the argument against EQ is something along the lines of it ruining technicalities or limiting dynamics, and so on. Let me say that if you found this to be the case, then put whatever restrictions on EQ that you're comfortable with, and leave it at that. Like if you're worried about that, stick to shelf filters or wide Q filters and be happy. But for those who aren't persuaded that this is even a thing in the first place, this argument isn't gonna be the strongest. So I'm gonna give different reasons now. For that, there are more objective reasons to not use EQ liberally. The first of these is that our individual ears are going to impact the sound on its way to the eardrum. Now we have to once again talk about the head-related transfer function, or HRTF. I previously said that HRTF is the way that your head and ears impact incoming sound, but it's also the reason why target curves like the Harman target typically look the way that they do, you know, with the rise that it has. The rise and then it goes back down. And each of us has an HRTF that is unique to our own head and ears. So how does this relate to EQ? Well, the problem is that you're not looking at a headphone's frequency response at the eardrums of individual people when you're evaluating it on a graph, nor are you considering their unique head-related transfer function. This means we can't be sure the change made with EQ will be desirable for individual people, even if that change gets it closer to the target on a graph. And again, those graphs are done on measurement rigs, not actual humans. And those measurement rigs have their own HRTF as well. Additionally, it's also important to consider that the most commonly used target, the Harman target, is smooth to one third or one half octave. And this means that it's not high res enough to perfectly indicate the various ear and canal resonance that we have. So if you just outright match the coarse grained target or highly smoothed target, like if you make adjustments relative to the measured results there and get it to match the target, it's kind of like doing surgery with a blunt instrument. And again, as I mentioned in that previous video, this becomes particularly annoying above 5K. You're better off leaving that region alone if you can, or it's meaningfully better if that region of the headphone is already good enough because the adjustments required to get it to match your own HRTF would end up being much more fine grained adjustments than the ones that you would make in the lower frequencies if that's where the problem areas were. And at the very least, in the treble, matching the target is bound to be less desirable than doing EQ adjustments by ear and achieving a result that's more personalized to your own HRTF. And unfortunately, I don't think we can expect people to do this, and they will more commonly match the target with the profile and expect it to sound better. Now, as it happens, in many cases, it might actually sound better, especially in situations where the headphone's frequency response, like the default tuning there, is particularly strange. Like if you have a really weird result there in the treble above 5K, matching the target is actually gonna sound better. But is it gonna sound best? I'm actually gonna say it's highly unlikely that it's gonna sound best. And there is always a chance that it'll sound worse if the headphone in question was already pretty close to your own HRTF. So matching the target there is somewhat of a concession, or like saying, well, at least this is reasonable. And beyond that, we also have to remember that within the Harman research, there's a segmentation paper that also shows, you know, the various different groupings. There's that cluster analysis that was done, the groupings of preferences around the target. And so you shouldn't really expect that, you know, perfectly matching the target is really where you fall. Really, this just means that we shouldn't be so confident that achieving Harman 
is what's going to sound best, but rather that it merely won't sound wrong to most people. Now, here's where I have to say that if that's your goal, then by all means go ahead and use a profile to achieve the target. But I'd like to think that the whole reason for diving into EQ in the first place is to make it more personalized. Now, back to the concern that I mentioned at the beginning of this video with questions around, you know, my evaluations and how EQ plays a role. If there are fine grained elements above 5K that are noticeably wrong sounding, regardless of whether they are close to the target or deviate from the target, then that's a much bigger issue than a lack of a base shelf, for example. And it should be critiqued with that in mind. But back to what we were talking about. There's still a few more problems when it comes to using EQ profiles that mean you may not actually be hearing the intended target, like the Harman target, if you think you've matched it with an EQ profile. And I think the simplest reason is that you don't know if the fit on your head is going to be the same as the coupling that was used for the measurement. You know, there's tons of positional variance there as it is. And so you might actually end up with a different result based strictly on the unique coupling that is your situation when you're actually wearing the headphone. And remember that head and torso simulators and ear and cheek simulators aren't actual human heads. And even in the best case, which would be the B and K 5128, that's not your head. So for example, you guys know me, I have a large head and I think audiophiles in general have larger than average heads. It's probably just to compensate for all the sadness that is in their souls. But essentially this means that there could be all kinds of positional variations or clamp pressure differences that are unique to your head and your wearing situations that throw off the frequency response result for you, which would then require a different EQ profile compared to the one that was done with the measurement fixture. Now that's an easy one, but the next reason to not use EQ profiles or not be confident about them is probably the most significant one, and it has to do with unit variation. This causes massive problems for those who like to use EQ profiles. Like for example, if a resonance is shifted to a different spot on one unit, the profile can potentially fix it on that unit and make it totally worse on, the, on another unit. Now, oftentimes manufacturers will have set tolerances for unit variation, um, and I think typically driver tolerances are actually pretty tight, but there are certain acoustic designs where this is bound to be more significant. For example, headphones that make use of really thick pads or where the pads are highly influential in the tuning have a much higher potential measured unit variation, even if the transducers being used are within very tight tolerances. With that said though, it's not like they've chosen thick pads for no reason. In many instances, this is one of the ways they're able to get the desired bass extension or like the full bass extension in low frequencies. At the same time, there are other designs like with the Sennheiser HD800S where the pads don't compress all that much and consequently, they won't change the tuning all that much over the course of their lifespan. So with those designs, you're bound to see less unit variation as a result as well. And unless manufacturers start shipping headphones with industry standard measurements for each individual unit, you simply don't know if your unit matches the one that was used in the measurement that the EQ profile was developed for. Unless, of course, you're the one doing the measuring. But I'm going to say those of us with that privilege don't count. Now, the next issue has to do with distortion. And as I mentioned in that previous 10 stages video, distortion doesn't matter very much in the long run unless it's bad. But when it comes to EQ, this is where things might start to matter. So not all headphones are going to respond equally well to EQ. And yeah, there's distortion related reasons to be careful about that. The most important of these is excursion limiting. A speaker can only move so far. And when you make it go further, it can produce a lot of really unpleasant distortion. In these cases, the distortion would be audible. A good example of this would be with some of the Focal headphones. When you're playing those headphones at typical listening levels, they don't have any of these issues, but if you push the bass, like by adding a significant bass shelf with EQ, they can actually clip, um, or it sounds like kind of like a buzzing sound. So I think it's a fairly straightforward example. And this is part of why you can't, or at least shouldn't, just EQ every headphone to perfectly match the Harman target, because it has a bass shelf there, or it's this way, bass shelf. <laughs> and this is also the case for headphones that roll off in the bass. If you try to match the target with these, the odds of hitting the maximum excursion of the driver is much higher. It's the same reason why EQ isn't going to make it so that your small bookshelf speakers can shake the whole room like it would if you had a subwoofer. And the reason that this happens is that the headphone is becoming strongly nonlinear, or in other words, a one decibel increase in voltage going into it is no longer translating to a one decibel increase in sound pressure level coming out of it. So while headphones are behaving normally or behaving well, their distortion tends to be fairly low order, but a sudden transition to this kind of nonlinearity makes for a lot of high order distortion, which is not at all masked or much less masked, and it would, it's going to sound a lot worse. And this can happen throughout the whole frequency range, even at high frequencies, although the headphone driver isn't necessarily physically striking against anything at that point. EQing up a region of the frequency response where a headphone is distorting significantly can produce a lot more distortion and sound worse than, say, leaving the uneven frequency response of that Abyss AB1266 headphone alone. Now, this won't always be the case, and with anything to do with distortion, it's very dependent on your listening levels because distortion is related to level. But it's one reason that you can be pretty sure that you can't turn your Cost Porta Pro into an LCD4. 
Now thankfully the LCD4 here can handle the EQ required without any issues. So what's the takeaway here? In my view, while yes, you can theoretically save a headphone with a wonky tuning with EQ, uh, there are limits to that. And more importantly, you shouldn't have to. Now, this doesn't mean that every headphone has to match the target. In fact, while I use the target to evaluate headphones, I don't think that everything should be tuned uh, to match it. In some ways, it's because there's so much more information in frequency response that isn't related to target adherence and deviation that using EQ liberally has the potential to royally screw things up. And the more you do it, the more you realize this. Ideally, you should try to get headphones where you don't have to do all that much EQ or where the EQ adjustments you do make are in the lower frequencies. If you happen to have a headphone that has a tuning that you're not thrilled with and you're dead set on using EQ profiles, sure, it might actually improve the sound. But here's what I'm saying to you. Don't just throw on the profile and feel confident that you've got the best sound quality. Treat these profiles as a starting point because they're not guaranteed to actually be the right result for you. Don't just fire and forget EQ profiles. You have to actually use your ears to dial in the fine-grained adjustments if you're going to make them in the first place. Because the treble range in particular is a total crapshoot that will vary significantly depending on the individual person's ear and canal features. And for those who know they won't do any of this, which I imagine is most people, the EQ optional headphone recommendations are your best bet. Now for me, I think my threshold for a good result with EQ will be a little bit lower than perfectly matching the target because of both the facts that I've just mentioned in this video about individual HRTF variation and because the brain also does a lot of work for us. It doesn't take very long to get used to something. And in my view, this also leaves room for headphone character or sound signature as well. You know, people like all kinds of different things. So really for me, EQ is about fixing major issues like harmonic imbalances or making, you know, wide filter adjustments to fit a preference, like adding a bass shelf, for example. So what does this mean for high-end headphones that have a more flavored or esoteric tuning? Well, in my view, they have to at least achieve a decent balance between fundamental and their resonant harmonic tones with music. <laughs> they don't have to perfectly match the target in order for me to recommend them for the reasons that I mentioned in this video. And there's absolutely room for preference and flavor. But if that flavor is bad, then that's a problem. In these situations, of course I'll try to get them to sound as good as I can to my ear. It's just that in an evaluation of a headphone, I have to ask myself, should we really expect people to do this? And my answer is honestly, no. Now with that said, there is a sense in which it might be worth it to dive into EQ for one reason or another. You like the technicalities or the comfort or the build quality and so forth. Again, I'm looking at you little guy. But simply put, for an evaluation, if a headphone is EQ required because whatever tuning the manufacturer went for is so wonky that without EQ things just sound wrong, then that is a valid criticism and it should be indicated as such. Anyways, that does it for this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.